Chapter 1. The Russian Economy Before the Imperialist War Since the beginning of the 20th century, capitalism in Russia has entered the highest and last stage of its development, imperialism. The concentration of production which reached a fairly high degree by the end of the exiat century, since the beginning of that 20th century is even more intensified. In 1901 industrial enterprises with the number of workers in excess of 1,000 accounted for 1.3% of all enterprises, out of the number of subordinates supervised by the factory inspection, and in them 30.9% of the total number of workers worked. In 1912, there were 2.1 such enterprises, and in them there were 38.2% of the total number of workers. Statistical Yearbook for 1914, p. 199. In terms of the degree of concentration of production, Russia's industry exceeded even the United States. While in Russia, at enterprises employing more than 500, 54% of all workers worked in the United States only 33% of all workers worked in similar enterprises. In England, after the war, in 1926, the 60 largest coal mining enterprises concentrated only slightly more than 50% of coal production. In the United States in 1926, the 200 largest enterprises accounted for only 50% of the production of bituminous coal. In Russia, in 1912, 41 enterprises produced 71% of all coal production. Concentration of production was accompanied by the centralization of capital and joint stock companies, especially intensified during the years of revival of production, immediately preceding the war. In 1910, 115 joint stock companies with a fixed capital of 148,282,000 rubles were organized. In 1911, 1913 years, already established 617 joint stock companies with a fixed capital of 829,738,000 ,000 rubles. On the basis of the high concentration of production and the tremendous centralization of capital, there was a rapid growth of monopolies, mainly in the form of syndicates which by the beginning of the imperialist war had gained a dominant position in the most important branches of industry and in banks, and through them in the entire national economy of Russia. In the field of the metal industry, the monopoly position was taken over by the syndicate, Predominate Society for the Sale of Products of Russian Metallurgical Plants founded in 1902, in which, in 1912, 78.3% of sheet and universal iron was concentrated, 95% of beams and channels, 87.9% of bandages, and so on. The Society for the Trade in Mineral Fuels of the Donetsk Basin, Pradugal, which opened in 1906, in 1909, 1910, concentrated in its hands about 65% of all coal mining in the Don Base. This was absolutely enough to ensure that Pradugal actually dominated the coal market. In the oil industry, three companies, Russian General Oil Company, Shell, and Nobel Nobel, covered 86% of all share capital on the eve of the war and controlled 60% of all production. Significant development was also given to monopolies in the light and food industries. Back in the late XIX century, a syndicate of sugar refiners was organized, covering in the early 90s more than 90% of all sugar mills. The Tobacco Trust at the beginning of the war encompassed the 14 largest factories and controlled up to 50% of the total production of tobacco products and about 65% of the production of third-rate tobacco. The Match Syndicate, organized in 1914, covered 95% of all match factories and about 75% of all matches production. The data cited convincingly indicate that in the 20th century capitalism in Russia passed into the stage of monopoly capitalism, imperialism. The degree of concentration of bank capital and the intensive process of merging monopolistic banking capital with the industrial one also testify to this no less clearly. By the beginning of 1914, out of 46 commercial banks, 
the seven largest banks with a capital of 30 million rubles, and above concentrated more than 52% of their total banking capital. Russian for foreign trade in St. Petersburg international banks concentrated in their hands about 90% of all sugar exports and were full owners in the domestic sugar market. The international bank was interested in 22 industrial, commercial, transport and insurance enterprises with a total capital of 272.9 million rubles. In addition, in his hands were shares of two major St. Petersburg banks, Russian for foreign trade and Azovdan, and five most important private railways. In general, his influence thus spread to enterprises with a capital of about half a billion rubles. Lenin cites data that of the amount of 8,235 million rubles, the operating capital of St. Petersburg's largest banks, 3,687 million, i.e., more than 40%, accounted for the syndicates, Pradugal, Pradema, syndicates in the oil, metallurgical and cement industries. Consequently, concludes Lenin, the merger of banks and industrial capital, in connection with the formation of capitalist monopolies, has made tremendous steps forward in Russia. Lenin, Collected Works, Volume XIX, Pages 112, 113. On the basis of the merger of banks and industrial capital, the financial oligarchy grew. It is not necessary to speak about the export of capital from Russia to any large extent, but the rudiments of capitalist capitalism characteristic of imperialism and the trends towards its further development appear quite clearly in the period under review. Capital from Russia was exported to Persia, Afghanistan, China, to the Balkans. In spite of the relative youth of Russian imperialism and Russia's economic backwardness, it clearly revealed parasitism and decay already characteristic of monopoly capitalism, the transformation of progressive capitalism into dying capitalism. This was found in the technical stagnation and significant underutilization of the production capacities of various, most monopolized industries, sugar beet, oil, coal, metallurgy, cast iron melting, for example, amounted in 1910 to only 55 percent of the production capacity, in 1911, 63 percent, in 1912, 71 percent. Meanwhile, these were years of industrial growth. The number of rentiers living with a haircut of coupons grew, and speculative stock transactions with securities intensified. In terms of securities, Russia was inferior to the most developed four capitalist countries, the United States, Britain, Germany and France, but outperformed all other capitalist countries. In 1910, the amount of securities in Russia reached 31 billion francs. The development of monopolistic, imperialist capitalism in Russia was distinguished by certain features. One of the main features of Russian imperialism was the presence in the Russian economy of significant remnants of serfdom. The most important of these remnants was the large estates of the nobility and landlords and the associated forms of feudal exploitation of the peasantry. 28,000 owners, wrote Lenin in 1907, are concentrating 62 million. Des, that is, according to 2227 dis. For one. The vast majority of these latifundi belonged to the nobility, namely 18,102 possessions, of 27,833 and 44,471,994 dis. land, i.e., over 70% of the total area under the latifundia. The medieval land ownership of feudal landlords is depicted by these data with complete clarity. IBID Volume. She, p. 337. This enormous land wealth of feudal landowners, these 28,000, noble and smoky landlords, who owned 62 million dissidents of land, were opposed at the opposite pole by 10 million ruined and crushed by feudal exploitation of peasant farms that owned a total of 73 million dissidents. On this basic background, Lenin wrote, the astonishing backwardness of technology, 
the neglected state of agriculture, the oppression and plugging of the peasant masses, the endlessly diverse forms of feudal and corvi exploitation are inevitable, I abide. In his article, Surfing in the Countryside, written in April 1914, Lenin cites a number of interesting facts and figures illustrating the widespread use of feudal forms of exploitation in the countryside on the eve of the imperialist war. He points to the widespread use of such forms of bondage as winter processions, in which the term, obligated peasants, was preserved, even fresh in serfdom. In the spring of 1913 the number of obligated households reached 56% of the total number of households in the Chernigov province. Another widespread form of feudal exploitation was the use of a piece of land, the cultivation of land from half the harvest or the harvesting of haymaking from the third mall. The number of peasants cultivated by peasants fluctuated in different regions of Russia between 21 and 68% and the number of productive hayfields, between 50 and 185 percent of their own peasant land. In some cases, the landlords, in addition to paying the land for half the crop, and haymaking for two-thirds, were obliged to work even more free in landlord economy for one to two weeks, most often with a horse or with a teenager. Numerous remnants of serfdom, core of the exploitation in the form of workings, debt bondage, forced rent, interlacing with the increasingly capitalistic exploitation of the peasantry in the countryside by the growing rural bourgeoisie kulaks, merchants, usurers made the position of the bulk of the peasantry completely unbearable. The remnants of serfdom hampered the development of the productive forces in Russia, primarily in agriculture. Lenin pointed out that while on allotment peasant land the yield from tithes was 54 puts on average, in the landlord's land the average yield from tithes was, in the case of farming and processing to the account of the landowner, with landowner's inventory and using hired labor, 66 puds, with the mild processing, 50 puds, and when renting land by peasants, 45 puds. The landlord's lands, Lenin wrote, give rise to a worse harvest than the depleted, qualitatively inferior allotment lands under feudal money lending, the aforementioned use, and peasant rent, this enslavement, strengthened by feudal latifundia, becomes the main obstacle to the development of the productive forces of Russia. Lenin, Collected Works, Volume XII, P277. Another characteristic feature of the development of imperialist Russia was that it remained an economically backward country in comparison with Western Europe. The economic backwardness of Tsarist Russia was manifested in all areas of the national economy. The industry of Russia since the beginning of the XX century was covered by the crisis that afterwards, since 1903, passed into a prolonged depression which was replaced by a new revival only in 1910, and although production began to increase rapidly in the main branches of industry in 1910 cast iron smelting, which in 1910 amounted to 186 million puds, in 1913 it increased to 283 million puds, coal mining increased from 1,522 million to 2,214 million puds, in the old borders, respectively. But in all the time since the beginning of the 20th century, the backwardness of Russian industry compared to that of the advanced capitalist countries has not only not decreased, but even increased. So, if in 1900 the production of pig iron per capita was eight times less in Tsarist Russia than in the USA, three times less than in France, and six times less than in Germany, then in 1913 it was already eleven times less than in the US four times less than in France, and eight times less than in Germany. The entire industry of Russia in terms of gross output occupied the fifth place in the world on the eve of the war and the fourth in Europe. In particular, Russia occupied the sixth place in the world for coal mining and the fifth in Europe, the machine building industry, respectively, the fourth and third, the generation of electricity, the fifteenth and seventh, in absolute numbers, 
the output of the most important branches of heavy industry in Russia in 1912 compared with other major capitalist countries was in millions of pods.